the course is for two kinds of people. I really didn't want to leave anyone behind. So there's a lot of introductory material in the course. So it starts a little bit slowly just to make sure that everyone's caught up. And then once everyone is caught up with the fundamentals, I get into all the major components of marketing, which are obviously social media. I go deeply into SEO, search engine optimization, and then I go into how to get publicity. And then throughout all those things, there's a ton of little growth hacks that are sprinkled in there. You are listening to educationhackers.com, podcasting from Vancouver, Canada. Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now to introduce today's guest is e-learning evangelist, Steve Atwal. Today, I'm very happy to have Alex Genadinik on the show. Alex is a software engineer, mobile app entrepreneur, and the founder of Problemio.com, which is a company that creates tools and educational materials like online courses, books, and mobile apps for entrepreneurs. To date, Problemio has influenced well over 1 million entrepreneurs. Alex, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Tell us a bit more about your background, how you got into online education. What made you create comehike.com? Uh, well, thank you for, first of all, thank you for having me on, Steve. i um, really excited to do the show with you. Um, so Come Hike um, was a, a project I did before, and I, it's kind of the project where I got my feet wet in a way where I made a lot of mistakes and um, learned a lot. And because I made a lot of mistakes, I realized that so many mistakes could be avoided with just a little bit of good advice, uh, which is why um, my current business focuses heavily on educating entrepreneurs because one piece of good advice can prevent terrible like mistakes that can waste a lot of money and time. Um, and it's just some of them are so preventable. So really, that's why I kind of wanted to empower entrepreneurs who were kind of, who are kind of like me a few years ago. Um, and I'm really, really actually passionate about it because I myself have, you know, made it so much harder on myself um, by not getting the advice or not having the advice available. Um, that I, you know, I didn't want others to go through the same thing and make it easier for them. That's awesome. You have 34 courses on Udemy. Most are on doing online business much better, but some are fitness. We're going to focus on one of those courses, your course entitled Marketing Strategy to Reach 1 Million People. You had a really good testimonial by one of my previous interviewees, Nick Loper, who uh, I had on episode 13 of Education Hackers. He gave you a testimonial and his words, and I quote, are, Alex's course is an excellent introduction to marketing with a focus for online business. He covers the fundamentals of marketing that can be applied to any business, as well as some high value tactical strategies related to SEO and social media. In fact, I had to pause the course to explore one tactic I've never considered before, so I'm eager to test that out. Now that's high praise indeed. You didn't pay him to write that, did you? No, but uh, Nick Loper is a great friend of mine. Uh, so, I mean, but but he's, he's very well familiar with my work. And, you know, a, a lot of the work we do is kind of parallel because I learn a lot from him and his podcast. And, you know, like, you know, he kind of hopefully learns something from me as well. So, <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I've known him for a while now. And we've actually kind of been growing our businesses in parallel together. And he's changing a lot of ideas. Yeah, he's a great guy. I had him on episode 13. I was just joking. <laughs> yeah. But before we get into your online course, how do you like to relax when you're not working? How do you unwind? Do you have any hobbies? Well, I love playing soccer, although right now it's winter, so I kind of can't. Um, so I recently joined, um, I'm a newbie, but I recently joined a boxing club. Um, it's, it's something that's very new for me. But as you saw on my Udemy, I already pulled in my boxing trainer and we made a course about it. So I don't waste any time. It's kind of like my re relaxation is only a step away from my work. Yeah, you have some interesting courses on fitness, uh, kickboxing, how to lose weight, how to get really fit and so on. Yeah, you have a bunch of nice videos on fitness as well, as well as business. What was your passion before you created your online courses? Was it fitness or something totally different? Uh, well, I always, I've always been active. Um, but obviously, you know, that's not, that shouldn't be a person's only hobby. Um, so I had this amazing hobby. Um, of, I used to love philosophy and I actually was, had a dream of getting, um, I found this PhD program, um, to study aesthetics, which is the philosophy of beauty, right? And 
it's really the philosophy of why makes a, why art makes us tick, why we, why we respond to it so well, right? So it was it was a cerebral way to think about art because a lot of people just take it in and they say, oh, that's nice, it made me feel some way, but they don't think further about it. But 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 there's in a way there's some sort of a formula for how art you know um, influences people in different ways. So actually, so I wanted to study that. I wanted to get a PhD in that. Um, and, um, I didn't, <laughs> um, but, but that was, uh, one of the things that I like, kind of, one of the things that I was studying on my own a lot and exp- exploring on my own. And I still kind of always, when I get a chance to talk to people about it, but, uh, now it's just a kind of like a far away thing. Do you find that you, in the back of your mind, you apply some of those principles to your courses? So, you know, creating really good user-friendly courses and also the content that you use for your courses to empower and uh, create awesome material for other people. Do you find you use aesthetics for your courses, your online courses? Well, I hope all my students find my find my courses as poetry. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's my hope. I, I don't think all of them do, but um, but it, it's not so much the visual. It's it's more like the. Ce- I was interested in the cerebral, so it would it wouldn't it wouldn't be like visual design kind of things. It would be more like um how people you know interact and how they feel and things like that. It's, it's partially psychological as well. Um, I don't know that I put too much of that into um how I specifically structure my business, but certainly it's it's shaped how I carry myself in all situations. So I'm sure a lot of that just is. He's just a part of me now. Let's talk about your online course, Marketing Strategy to Reach 1 Million People. Give us a bird's eye view of the course. What do you cover? Who is it for? And why should people be signing up for it? The course is for two kinds of people. I really didn't want to leave anyone behind. So there's a lot of introductory material in the course. So it starts a little bit slowly just to make sure that everyone's caught up. And then once everyone is caught up with the fundamentals, I get into all the major components of marketing, which are obviously social media. I go deeply into SEO, search engine optimization, and then I go into how to get publicity. And then throughout all those things, there's a ton of little growth hacks that are sprinkled in there. So for example, um, when I talk about Twitter, yeah, I talk about, you know, anyone can explain how, how to do basic Twitter marketing. At this point, it's a no brainer. But what about the subtly known things like how to increase engagement of tweets, right? Like how many hashtags you should put in the, in, in your tweets, how to structure a tweet, where to put the link, where to put the text, especially how to dominate. A really cool lecture I have actually is how to dominate the, the hashtags, right? Because some of the discovery happens through hashtags and there are ways to dominate the Twitter algorithm to get Twitter to actually keep you in the hashtags. Because, you know, if you, if you tweet something... You'll be in that hashtag for a second and then, you know, like a million other people will tweet and your hash and your tweet will just go down and, and nobody will see it. But I talk about ways of how to get your tweets to stay up in the hashtags for hours. Right. So and nobody, very, very, very few people know how to do that. And those are the kind of growth hacks that I talk about for almost any platform, Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, um, even Kindle books. Um, and especially SEO. And, and I really talk about SEO in a deep way, not in the, you know, when people th- think about SEO now, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Google search. But the first thing I do is I break that in, in my students. It's not incorrect, but it's very small. It's a very narrow way to look at it because the right way to look at it is to look at search as something that aids content discovery on almost any platform whether it's mobile applications, podcasts, Amazon, YouTube, you know, a whole bunch of platforms where, you know, Yelp.com, if you have a local business, other smaller sites, content discovery just keeps happening through search. And what I talk about isn't specifically SEO for Google, even although I do cover the Google SEO because that's the biggest topic. But I also urge people to think holistically about search and uh, because Google SEO I mean, if you think about it, it's in the history of the world, it's the single most competitive marketing environment, period, by far. I mean, there's never been as crazy a marketplace for discovery, right? And there's also YouTube marketing, 
and other online marketing strategies, and we'll, we'll get into that. I just wanted to get a bird's eye view of your course before we dive straight into it. You have uh, 100 videos and documents as part of this course. Yeah. So that's quite a lot of material that you that you have as part of this course. Are these videos easy enough to follow for the business type of people, or are they more technical? Uh, most of them are not technical. Of course, you know, when it comes to search, I talk about algorithms. And for people who don't deal with algorithms, that may be a scary word, but in my view, it's simple. And I do spend the first section of the course just on basics. So people get how I think about marketing. And then, you know, it, it's a good way to enter the course. My feeling is that, you know, I ended up making it for everybody because there's enough, there's enough introductory material and there's enough advanced stuff that ideally I would take a beginner marketer. Uh, which many first-time entrepreneurs are, and, and make them into a very strong marketer. That that was my goal for the course. Yeah, it's a very comprehensive course. Uh, from what I've seen, you cover quite a lot of material. So I was really impressed. Um, I think Nick Loper said it really well. Maybe we can ask a few leading questions here before we get into some of the other parts of your course. For people that may not know, what what is KPI and setting goals for your marketing efforts. How do you use KPI and what is KPI? All right. So it's so KPI is, stands, is an acronym stand that stands for Key Performance Indicators. And it's something that every business owner needs to choose what that is for their business and track that obsessively, right? So like if you're YouTube, like let's say you're a YouTube channel owner, right? So that the, some of the most important KPIs may be views, it may be obviously revenue because that's that's a KPI for any business. But, you know, some of the things that are a little bit more deep are, you know, are people watching, you know, what percentage of the people, the video are people watching, right? Are people enjoying the video? And so you want to get KPIs that also get you the experience of the person, of the of the consumer. So like I check the the duration of the videos watched, right? Like where do people fall off? And that really gives me a good sense of, what went wrong in that video, and then I can kind of analyze it and improve that. So for so like you know for YouTube, it's like um, I mean they're very obvious sometimes. For for more complex businesses, the KPIs may be more complex, but generally they're you know for web businesses, it's all about views, duration on site, conversion of various pages, you know simple things, and ultimately revenue and profit and things like that, and growth also, and not just growth but also acceleration, deceleration things like that. Um, so, I mean, for most web entrepreneurs, it's actually relatively simple. Yeah, you also talk about sales funnel, a sales funnel and A-B split testing. And then you get into uh, the concept of the purple cow that Seth Godin mentioned. So what's uh, what's A-B split testing for people that don't know? And why does Seth Godin talk about the purple cow? So A-B testing is something that I mean, I wouldn't like I wouldn't have ever made any successful product if I didn't do that. And for me, it was an, a matter of you know because the first product that I uh, made that was successful were my mobile apps, and I literally was. And this is actually a good example of how KPIs um, came into play here because I, I was every time I updated updated the app, I was tracking. You know, I put in different things into the app that allowed me to track different things. You know, I wanted to know like how much engage, engagement people were, were having with the app and are they spending more time, less time. And what I did is, you know, I always try different things, right? So I would put in like maybe one version of the home screen and then a second version of the home screen. And then I would track the KPIs. For A-B split testing, basically, I, I kept on putting different home screens for my app and kind of every day I would sort of check what the KPIs were, right? So... The A, you know, there would be like an A version of the home screen. Like, does it get me more click throughs on a certain button that I'm after? That, and and the button would obviously be a part of a sales funnel because, you know, I I'd have buttons that people, you know, like things that people enjoy and parts of the app. But there's also parts of the app where I had a sales funnel to sell them things, um, like my other apps or my other products. So it, there was like this combination of I, I continuously tested different layouts and different buttons and different text. And that was my A-B testing. You know, I was testing A versus B versus C versions of the home screen or any other screen, really. Um, and then I was testing how the traffic, how the users 
converted, whether they went, you know, how many, what percentage of them went deeper into the sales funnel. And then of course, once I got to a certain percentage of success, I stayed with that particular screen that converted people to doing the thing that I wanted them to do. Yeah, you can use um, for A-B split testing, there are tools that you can use to track and see where people are clicking on what buttons and what screens people are actually using and clicking on. So there are some plugins that will let you do that, for example, on WordPress. Do you get into some of that, some of the tools and the plugins and so on? I don't because most of my usability has been on apps. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a different world outside of WordPress. And there's, you know, especially when my apps were in major development, like there was a lot less tools like that. But certainly if I, the strategy that I use is kind of, I, I don't overdo any single particular page until I get traffic to it, until I get a significant chunk of traffic to it daily, right? From SEO or something like that. And then I'm like, okay, this page is something I can invest in. And then I do a lot of the A-B testing. Then I do a lot of the extra SEO, extra everything, extra conversion, extra, you know, put affiliate products in there or my products, right? Because, but, but before the page ranks, um, I, I kind of don't put too much effort. Um, I only kind of pounce on a page once I know there is like, it's getting good traffic and, um, by the sheer numbers, it will have, it will, it will be a money making page. Right. You need to get traffic before you can sort of fine tune that and see what works better. Tell us about some of your marketing mistakes. Ah, so yeah, so um, I made quite a few over time. And actually, um, I have this system that I sort of worked out for myself that kind of caught all my mistakes. And um, basically, early on, what I used to do was my mistakes were in kind of four major areas. Either I wasn't getting enough scale for whatever technique that I was doing. Um, I wasn't hitting the right target market with my promotions or the cost was too much either in time or money. Time is also, you know, a marketing tactic might be free in dollars, but it might take a long time. Like SEO is a great, the, the biggest example of that. That's also expensive. And then of course, the fourth thing was um, the, the, the traffic wasn't converting ultimately. So, I mean, the single biggest mistake was, um, and I think, and I see a lot of people doing this, was putting all my sort of basket, all my eggs into this basket of SEO, Google SEO. Um, and especially for a new business, that's a brutal choice. Like it's very hard for a new site. It's most niches are extremely competitive and there's going to be only a trickle of traffic before maybe the first three to six months can actually kind of kill the business because there just aren't enough leads. And if the entrepreneur put most of their eggs in that basket, like, like I did in the past, um, that, that's really a hard thing to get around. That seems to be a common mistake, isn't it? That most people, when they think of marketing, they think Google. Yeah, I mean, and Google is amazing if you can get it to work for you. I mean, it's amazing. But but certainly people don't quite, and I don't know what the, their mindset coming into it is and why it's so skewed, but it's always like people tell me the same thing. If I ask, if I ask a new person, a new business owner, what is your marketing strategy? Do you know that 80% of the time, approximately, they will tell me, they will repeat each other's sentences. They don't know it, but they will say exactly this. My marketing strategy is to promote my business on Facebook, Twitter, business cards, and flyers. So they, they say that. And then once they learn a little bit about web marketing, they add SEO right into it. You know, probably because some web agencies sold them on how great SEO might be. And, and then, you know, it's kind of like they just dive in and without a full, without, without a great overall strategy, you know, those are just kind of hacks, right? I think what a person really needs is to have a strategy that's really great for their specific business. And then they can go and execute on that plan, whether it's SEO or whatever. But I think a higher level strategy, they should have that first. Yeah, it seems like it's, it's a lot of work, marketing. Should you hire a marketing agency to do that marketing for you? I don't personally think so, because I think when you're first starting out, you should be, you should be first trying things on your own. Because a lot of it is kind of growth hacking. You don't ultimately know whether it's going to be a CEO that's going to work for you or audience building, maybe through a podcast or YouTube or something. You, most businesses that go to this growth hacking stage where they're actually, actually discovering what will be the things that will work. And also a, a lot of the marketing agencies, they're not cheap and the work is sometimes questionable, you know, because you don't know what they're doing, right? They can get you easily penalized in Google and you don't know what they did. Um, but, but what I really like is I like sort of getting your nose right into the issues and talking to your customers, 
and doing things like that. And that is actually the best marketing because your customers, if you interact with them, they'll actually tell you what's wrong with your product, what's right with your product, what they prefer, what they want you to do. And then they will help you create a better product. So like being on the, on the front lines, in, especially in the beginning, I think it's, it's like, it's priceless. Like it's, it's irreplaceable. Um, so I really encourage people, even a lot of people, they get intimidated. They don't like to do it. Um, they, they would prefer to put, give it off to somebody else to do. But I always encourage people to sort of try it on their own. Because even if they hire someone, they have to get to know at least what that person will do to, to make the decision of who to hire, how to hire, how much to pay, you know, how to allocate resources. So I think people should learn a lot of the marketing at least. I, I totally agree. I think you need to know what you're doing and how you're doing it before you can outsource it and get somebody else to do it. Because there's no way for you to monitor that. You need to know what's involved in marketing. And whether that's traditional marketing or online marketing, uh, you need to know what's involved before you can outsource it. Like you said, you're not always sure if you're getting the right people. Uh, I see a lot of people going onto Odesk or Fiverr and, and getting somebody cheap, but they may not be the right people that you want to do the marketing. And if they are, that's great. But uh, you do need to know what you're doing before you outsource it. So what do you see as some of the common social media marketing mistakes? Uh, sure. You know, I have a funny anecdote I'll tell you, and then I'll quickly answer your question. A lot of the people who sell marketing services online, not a lot, but some, they sometimes come to me and they're like, can you teach us SEO? And, and they're like already selling SEO services, right? So that's the kind of quality you get, right? It's like, they, they're they like, they don't know it either. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they can, they're, they're learning it from somebody else at the, at the time that they're selling it to somebody else, right? So they're learning by offering it as a service. Yeah, they just, they just want to get paid. They don't, you know, the, the ethics are kind of out the window, you know, especially, I, I, and I kind of understand them because I think in maybe in third world countries or um, I don't like to call them third world countries, but, you know, in some countries that are, you know, not, not as wealthy, I think, it, it, you know, people have to do what, what they have, to, what they can do to survive. You know, if that's what they have to do, I mean, that's, that's what they have to do. Yeah, I think uh, looking at ratings and reviews, because uh, a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of websites are getting better at uh, making sure that there are reviews and ratings for some people, individuals especially, that are offering these services. So tell us some of the, some of the common social media marketing mistakes. Right. So maybe not doing the good practice social media things, right? Um, like building a true audience that is engaged, that love you, right? Like like you're doing great, right? Like you have a fantastic podcast. People love you. You have regular listeners. The mistake, to, the mistake people would make is not take advantage of new media, like podcasting, YouTube, other social media, whereas that wasn't an opportunity maybe 15 years ago, right? Because that's only the, the gatekeeper. There used to be gatekeepers and people like you and I, maybe it would be harder for us to have our own media channels. But now we can establish relationships with thousands of people out there. And so I think one big mistake is not to sort of build an audience and not to position yourself as an expert in your niche, where if you have a big media channel, maybe like your podcast, maybe like my YouTube channel is becoming, then you, you're kind of positioning yourself as an expert. And when you position yourself as an expert, you gain trust. And when you gain trust, people start listening to you. They buy more, all that kind of stuff. Good stuff starts happening. So the mistake people make is they don't think this way. They think short-sightedly. They ask me, so if I make a Twitter account, will it help me sell? And, you know, obviously not really. Well, one mistake that I see on Twitter is what they call Twitter bombing. Twitter bombing is basically tweeting too many times the same thing over and over again. And also maybe including a direct link to an audio or video that you want played. So that when people look at that or click on that, the audio or video starts playing automatically. And it looks like, you know, those people are getting lots and lots of downloads and lots and lots of plays when, in fact, the engagement isn't really there. Do you find that uh, to be an issue? Sometimes, although I I think it's even more short-sightedness. I mean, people, and I, actually, I guess what you're describing is exactly this. It's kind of a symptom of this, you know, this people have this rush of like, I want to sell, sell, sell. They have to make money today. You know, they don't have a lot of channels to promote their business. So Twitter and Facebook become the the main, you know, first things they think about. And then they just go and sell, 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 right? Whereas, you know, of course you understand it's like, you know, you have to build trust. You know, it, it takes a little bit of time before you can really sell. Um, and you, I think the really only way to sell on social media is 
by building an audience who actually are engaged and who listen to your stuff and who trust you and who respect you. Because then when you, every, every once in a while, you can send them promotional messages and they'll actually, they'll actually go for it if they respect you. Exactly. I think the engagement part is really important because if somebody's just coming to your website, your video, your audio by mistake, they're not the people that are going to be engaged in what you have to offer. Maybe sometimes there might be a chance encounter and somebody does like what you have to offer. But a lot of times, if they're coming there by mistake, <laughs> they're not going to be the engaged users that you want or engaged buyers that you want. Now, you talk about hashtags in your social media updates. Now, I see hashtags, and I use them myself as well, and usually they're prefixed by a hash sign. Now, does that, when I see stuff like that, and I see somebody posting an update and a status update or, or a message, and I see these hashtags, and I know that they're there for a reason, they're there so that when people are searching those particular keywords, your updates may appear and so on. But it sometimes tends to make things not so readable. How do you use hashtags? How do you recommend using hashtags in social media updates? Research shows that two hashtags is the ideal number, not zero, not one, not three. The reason for this is because having more hashtags, having hashtags in general, just gives you an extra amount of discoverability. So you should certainly have them. I know they make it harder to read and I'll have a remedy for that in just a second. And then one hashtag, it just may be not enough. Because you already made it harder to read, but then you're just getting one hashtag. It, research shows that, and, and my experience backs this up, that have, having two hashtags, usually that I just tack on at the very end of the tweet, um, is the optimal number. Because it gives you enough extra discoverability to people who don't already follow you, which is something you really want, because you always want new people to discover you. And so, and three becomes too many. Three, four, five, that just, that just becomes too many, and it looks spammy. The way that you want to make your tweet readable is never use the full 140 characters because people feel like they need to use the full 140 characters. But research shows that when you use between 100 and 120 characters, for example, that is typically the best range because shorter tweets, think about how people scan tweets. They go, they basically scan, right? And then they see what might be interesting. And what might be interesting is something that's easier to read, easier to consume. And the thing that's easier to consume is a shorter tweet. So even though people, you might not be a known person or people might not like really be that engaged, your tweet will be shorter and it will be more attractive for their eyes to land on. And just from that, you, you'll, fi you'll fix all the problems with you know the readability issues of hashtags and having actually sh tweets that aren't the full 140 characters actually helps to increase engagement. That, that's true because we seem to be inundated with information from all all sources, social media, websites, and we have all this information flowing towards us. And usually we just want to quickly look at something and see if it's of any worth or any value to us. So making uh, updates shorter and also using two hashtags instead of more than two hashtags and putting them at the end instead of at the beginning or inside your text that seems to be good advice, really good advice, because it makes your main message readable. And at the same time, you can have your hashtags and put them at the end. That's really good advice. Thank you. So if we look at some of the other social media, uh, we can use Google+, Plus. we can use Quora. Quora is another service uh, that gives you updates, and you can see what's happening for different areas and categories and subjects and so on. How do you use Quora for marketing? Yeah, I love Quora and I recommend it to people. Um, Quora is a lesser known social media site than, for example, Twitter or Facebook. So it's not something that most first time entrepreneurs think about, but I found it to be incredibly effective in a number of ways. First of all, it's a very big site. So you can, and they would, they allow you to link to your site. So it's basically Quora stands for, you know, it's a play on the word question and it's basically the most popular Q and A site right now. Most people are familiar with the genre from, uh, Yahoo answers uh, from back in the day. But Yahoo Answers is for the most part defunct or completely defunct. Um, and the current top Q&A site is Quora. And the great thing about it is that, again, if you're, if you're trying to position yourself as an expert, it really would help if you answered questions on Quora within your expertise. And then the great thing is at the bottom of your answer, of course, you should always provide a great, great answer. Because, you know, in social media, it, 
all the time. It's it's about the quality of your content, right? And same with Quora. You know, obviously you want to provide a great insightful answer because that insightful answer makes people go, aha, I learned something. I trust this person a little bit more now. I might click on more of their stuff. And so what happens is Quora allows you to link to your website, which can actually bring you a lot of traffic over time. Um, but the cool thing also is that you can embed YouTube videos and rank help you to rank your YouTube videos as well by answering Quora questions. So Quora is actually, um, if I'm trying to rank something, um, Quora is like an indis- indispensable part of that strategy, typically. I've got to use that more. Actually, I'm on Quora and I do get updates. You also get into how to get more subscribers on YouTube. You get into podcast marketing, which is uh, interesting. And on Twitter, how to consistently rank in hashtag searches and automate it with WordPress. And you do your all your status updates using Buffer. Now, there's so many topics here and so many different sections in your course. It's, it's really, really, really um, good that you have all this material here. What's one tip to get more subscribers on YouTube? I'm going to give a one tip that's like two-sided. It's actually really simple. When I, when I started, I was like, how do I get more subscribers? But really, what you got to do is provide, you, got, you have to really create good videos because without that, I mean, nobody will subscribe, right? So this is like a must. But once you create good videos, if you get a lot of views for those videos, the subscribers will just come. And what you do is, you know, there is the, uh, you can kind of put the overlay like, an annotation, you know, you can say, please subscribe to the channel. You can encourage people to subscribe to the channel. If you are the actor of the, in the channel, you can just, when you finish the video, you can say, hey, guys, please subscribe to my channel. Or, you, or there's, not, there's other ways to create such calls to action. If, even without the calls to action, people will subscribe if the videos are good and you're able to get a lot of views to the videos. So it doesn't have to be a rocket science, really. It's really about getting views and to get the views, you basically have to rank the videos. Since I explained search in, in depth, there's quite a bit in my course and like you'll be able to rank videos um, pretty easily. With, in all these tactics that I use in my business, I, I they're in the course. So for example, me, I, I continuously rank for very competitive keywords on YouTube. For example, like Facebook marketing, I'm somewhere in their top 10 or something, you know. Twitter marketing, I'm on the first page. So it's like stuff like that. Um, I don't know offhand, you know, I, I don't like look at it, but but you know, it's basically using my SEO strategies because they're universal, right? It's not Google search only; it's YouTube also, YouTube search, and um, so you can easily get, you can easily start to rank um, your videos with the tips that I have, um, and then the subscribers will just come. I mean, not that easily, of course. I mean, it it, it, it takes a lot of effort, but but it isn't a rocket science. It's it's a straightforward path. Yeah, you have a lot of material, like I said. Um... And you get into long tail versus short tail SEO keywords. I actually have the long tail pro software, which is uh, interesting. <laughs> that's, that's actually not a bad piece of software. And how to dominate Google's top 10 search results, 10 ways to get press coverage, how to get more views on YouTube, how to promote a mobile app. Yeah, there's a bunch of material here. I mean, you use a plugin to automate posting to Twitter, and there's a bunch of plugins for that. Which one do you use? Yeah, the one that I like is Re- Revive Old Post. It's a free plugin. I mean, they have a paid version, but I just use the free one. What it does is basically you can you can tell it what you consider an old post, which I just say it's if it's one day old, it's an old, it's an old post, and then you tell it how often to retweet that stuff. And what happens is you you get to use hashtags as well, so you get to choose hashtags. And what's really cool is if you use and this is a really cool growth hack. If you use the same hashtags in your tweets all the time. Pick a very narrow range of hashtags and use them all the time. And especially if you get engagement on your tweets, what's going to happen is you're going to build authority within that hashtag. So if you tweet that hashtag, something with that hashtag, it's not going to go down the list in one second, right? In, in the hashtag searches. It's going to stay up there, actually. And it's going to stay up there longer, the, the more authoritative you become. So that's actually something cool that I discovered just from using this WordPress plugin and um it's like one of the coolest things you can do on Twitter. I, I Before, I didn't even realize that there's such a thing as hashtag authority. And then as I started noticing myself having like tweets that are like three hours old and they're still showing up in the hashtags, I was like, wow. And then, and then I, looked, I looked deeper into it and I learned all about how, you know, Twitter's algorithm a little bit, you know. And um, yeah, just using hashtags regularly and having some WordPress plugin like that completely automate the process. I don't even have to do anything. 
That's excellent. I mean, when I look at some of the, the Twitter posters, they seem to have these quotes. They pick up quotes. Then they post a certain number of times. It seems like sometimes they're, they're posting every hour. Now, how often do you recommend posting on Twitter? And I'm not sure how these people are doing it, but they're picking up quotes from somewhere and posting quotes and then a link back to their website and maybe some hashtags. Do you do you recommend a certain number of times to post every day? Not really. Um, it really depends on your audience and you know um, how how engaged they are, how much you want to engage them, things like that. Personally, sometimes if I if I have more things to promote, I, I post more regularly. You know, if I'm busy, I I I don't because you know sometimes some of the, my tweets are pre done, sort of prepackaged, but some of the tweets I just tweet whenever, like whenever I kind of feel like I need to, I'm already working on something, I need to promote it. Um, I just tweet. So I kind of, you know, I, I don't really advocate a strict number of tweets. It, it's really, I more advocate a feel for your audience. And I think actually people who like, who do the Twitter bombing kind of thing where they just tweet continuously and tweet too much, despite that that's so annoying, they tend to have some of the fastest organic growth rates of subscribers um, that, that I notice. Um, so actually tweeting an, an incredibly annoying amount will actually help you grow your, you know, ironically enough, um, it, it's might be seen as a bad practice and might annoy a lot of people, but it's actually something that gets you a lot of, um, extra, extra followers. Yeah. It's interesting because I see some counts that are just, you can tell they're automated because they're posting every hour on the hour. And a lot of times they're just quotes. They're just quotes, famous quotes or other quotes. And they're just posting every hour. And they seem to have 20,000, 30,000 followers. And uh, uh, yes, they seem to have a lot of followers. I'm not sure how engaged they are, but, but they do seem to have a lot of followers. I wouldn't trust too much of the of the tens of thousands of followers because they're easily purchased. And they're easily the followers are easily hacked too because it's kind of like, you know, there's the you follow, I follow, you follow, those kinds of schemes. And, you know, I mean, you can also buy a ton of followers on Fiverr so. I mean, I wouldn't look at the follower numbers, really, you know, because sometimes, like, you really don't know. No, you don't. It's it's back to the engagement. How many of these actual subscribers are actually coming to your website and actually going through that sales funnel and clicking through to what you want them to click through to? I'd like to ask a few techie questions or techie-related questions for our audience. My listeners are people who are either starting to create their first online course or trying to figure out ways to improve their existing course. So some of these questions are meant to help answer their questions. What was the biggest mistake you made when you first started creating your online course? Uh, video and audio production issues by far. I mean, you got to get a good microphone. And the second thing is I have a funny background that I used to use. I would invest in a green screen kind of thing. And if you can, uh, you know, people buy software called Camtasia, which allows you to create really smooth, beautiful screen, screen flows. So you can talk and have a PowerPoint and your video at the same time and show things um, on the screen. So you can show a lot at the same time. And it's this software that a lot of the course instructors use. It's called Camtasia. So it's a microphone, nice background. If you're, if you're going to be in the shot and if you're going to do screen, shot, uh, screen flows, then it's going to be Camtasia Studio um, software. Um, that's going to boost your course quality manifold right, right there. Now, you have a number of courses. You have a number of courses on Udemy and on Problemio. How do you create your courses? Do you have a workflow? Do you have a, an outline that you put together first, a detailed outline? How do you determine what to include and not to include? Yeah, well, first of all, I think about what might be missing in Udemy, for example, where there might be still you know, spots where there's not too much competition, things like that, but still a lot of demand. Then uh, once, I nail, once I come up with a, spot, with a course like that, a good example is the boxing course, right? When I made my boxing course, there was only one other boxing course in Udemy. So it's very little competition. And then I created an outline on paper. So, you know, the different punches, your stance, how to defend yourself, right? So, so those are all actually different sections, right? So there's a full section of the how to punch. How, then there's a stuff about how to kick. Then there's a stuff about how to defend yourself, you know, like how to get, you know, how to get, make people miss punches and things like that. And then there's uh, other like training and what, you know, I don't remember the curriculum right now, but it, it naturally, it's kind of almost writing a, a high school or a college essay. You kind of have to build an outline 
And having that outline makes the shooting of videos really simple because, you know, you already kind of know what you're filming and what needs to be said. So having that outline is actually probably the single most useful thing to make the course um, like really well structured for people and kind of feel natural and have a good flow so they don't, they don't quit in, they don't quit in the middle. So the outline is really, I think, one of the most important things. And then, of course, if you can, when you create the concept for your course, if you can figure out something that will make it unique and original, like, for example, my course on, um, I know you wanted to just stick with one course, but, well, I guess let's stick with the, the marketing strategy. I mean, so the concept for that course is basically, you know, really good growth, right? And that's the angle. If people want that, you know, I add that uniqueness to the course and I sprinkle that kind of stuff in where, you know, other courses on marketing might not have that exactly. So, so you kind of have to also in the pre-planning, think of the, what's going to make the course unique and really kind of catchy and interesting for students because um, ultimately they have to, they have a lot of choice and yours has to stand out and be interesting. And it's good if you pre-plan that from the beginning. So how long did it take you to create your course? Um, not long at all. If, um, if it's well planned. So if the, if the structure, the outline is, is in place, which is not hard to do, you know, I kind of usually think about the outline in my head for a while, shape it, and then to put it on paper, it's, you know, just a couple of minutes, even if the course is long. And then once you have an outline, I basically sit myself in front of the camera and talk about each topic one by one. And then I edit the topics, upload them. And really, if, if I, if I'm organized, a course can take just a couple of days to, to make, really. And then that's pretty much it. You know, then you got to get it re- past the review process of Udemy. Um, that might take another week or so. You know, th- they're very careful about audio quality, video quality. So some of the things I have to reshoot or re-edit. And then the course is live usually. So it, it does, it's not long at all. Now, you have courses on Udemy as well as on Problemio. And uh, where are most of your courses and why did you decide to use both platforms? Uh, actually, the ones in Problemio, they just point right to Udemy. So all my courses are on Udemy. Why did you decide to use Udemy as opposed to self-hosted? First of all, I, I like promoting my business from native platforms um, rather than my own site, right? Because it's the same with Kindle books. Why don't I sell Kindle books from my own site? Why don't I sell it? You know, why do I sell it on the Kindle? Well, because Kindle has millions of shoppers and my site doesn't. Same, It's the same thing. You know, why are people selling on eBay instead of... Uh, on their site, right? I mean, it's possible to sell on your site, but all those large sites like, you know, Udemy, eBay, Amazon, they already have the audience. You, you leverage discoverability. As long as you get your courses or products or whatever discovered on any platform, um, you can outsell by a crazy factor what you could do on your own site. Definitely. Um, Udemy has a huge, huge uh, marketing push. So they're everywhere, and they do offer some discounts sometimes where you get a lot of people signed up on these $10 courses. So, you know, they do have a huge marketing arm. How do you get paid? Do you get paid using PayPal? Yeah, you know what I mean? Just uh, pays through PayPal, and um, pretty simple, yeah. It's actually the only way they pay. Do you do any marketing on your own? Because I know Udemy pays instructors a certain amount if they bring in students versus if you bring in the students. Yeah, I promote my courses a lot on YouTube. And for example, like if people want to know how to plan a coffee shop, like write a business plan for a coffee shop, I have a video on that. And somewhere along the lines in the video or in the description, I kind of have a link, you know, I say, hey, if you want to know how to create a full business plan, well, I have a course for you and here's the discount. And, you know, that works to to a degree. It's all a matter of, you know, like I said, creating a good video, building trust within that video, and then getting the volume of viewers so that some of them they can convert. And that's kind of it. That That's really what I do. So looking back, what was the one tool, software or hardware, that you absolutely needed to create your online course? For me, I mean, obviously, it was my HD camera because I put my face in a lot of the videos and the quality was better than if I just recorded myself um, with, you know, with my laptop's camera. Especially when I started, that the laptop I had didn't have a great camera and, and things were fuzzy. So it's re- it's really like a good HD camera. That's an equivalent of a you know maybe Camtasia Studio if people are doing a lot of screen flows, screen flow videos. Now Udemy has a built-in forum to support um, 
the students, instructors uh, or course students. Now, how do you find that? Is that does that work well for you? Yeah, I love it. It's called Udemy Studio. It's a gigantic Facebook group of twenty six thousand people, and I'm on it every day, and I interact there daily, and I've become friends with some of the people there, and I learned a ton. So I recommend it to any potential instructor. Yeah, uh, the Udemy Studio is for instructors, and then for students, they do have uh, an interactive forum where they can log in and interact with the instructor and ask questions. So, Alex, take a few minutes and offer your best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. It's really simple, actually. Think about what you are expert in. Consider also that there are others who are experts in the same thing. And so, the second thing that you have to do is. Consider what will make your course super attractive and unique and exciting, right? More so than the other people's course who are also experts in the same thing, right? So what, what is the angle of the course? You know, have some unique angle. Um, and once you have those two things, the outline will be simple, especially if you're an expert, right? The outline will be simple. You can put yourself in the front of the camera or a screencast, whatever your, your content is, record it, and there you go. Right. And, but throughout the whole thing is being an expert, definitely having something unique about your course, some kind of an interesting concept or angle. And I didn't have that to my earlier courses, but my more successful courses, there were all some kind of angle to them. Even the marketing course we've been talking about today. If it was just marketing, that would be boring. A lot of people do marketing, but mine is all about how, how I got to a million people and how I teach others to do the same thing. So that's an exciting angle. Everybody who starts a business, they want to reach a million people with their marketing. So, you know, stuff like that. Alex, we have come to the end of the show. I could ask you a ton more questions about your course, but instead I'm going to leave a link to it in the show notes so people can visit your website and check it out for themselves. Thank you very much for being such an amazing guest on the show and for sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people connect with you online? So thank you actually for having me. And I really hope I was helpful and insightful to your audience. Um, if people want to reach out to me, I love hearing, hearing from people. The best email is uh, alex at problemio.com or they can visit problemio.com. Um, and there's a contact us and my email is all there and stuff like that. So it's either alex at problemio.com or problemio.com itself because all my resources are there. And of course, people can go to your show notes and all, all the links to my website and things like that will be there as well. Um, and if people are brave enough to try to remember my last name, my Twitter is at mylastname.com. So I'd love to hear from people there as well. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the Love It button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time.